All right, hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the GMB Show. Now in this episode, I've got a buddy of mine named Tony and Tony Federico. What's really up? Really neat guy. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. Now, Tony is a personal trainer and he's also wellness uh, consulting. He's out of Florida. Uh, he's the editor of Paleo Magazine, also the host of Paleo Magazine podcast. He's been a speaker at both Paleo FX and the Ancestral Health Symposium. He's even written a book on paleo grilling. Tony, wonderful to have you here, man. Uh, this this show, I want to talk a little bit about yeah. paleo lifestyle, uh, a little bit about paleo fitness, and the secret to grilling the perfect steak. Hey, Tony, like if it. you could just give us a little bit more about yourself uh, for my listeners out there. And again, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's pretty cool. I'm over in Jacksonville, Florida, and you're in Osaka, Japan, and yeah. we're able to have this conversation thanks to the kind of revolutionary power of the internet, which of course I, I don't think you'd want to call this paleo, but but maybe it is. Maybe we're having a, you know, face to face conversation, good, authentic, old fashioned human interaction. Yeah, um, so my background, as you mentioned, you know, personal training, I've been in the fitness business for about 10 years. Um, I first started really working seriously in the fitness industry at a gym in I think it was 2006. Prior to that, Studied uh, exercise science at the University of Florida, um, had a, a associate's degree in psychology. So I was just kind of interested in behavior and, and the way the mind worked and then obviously the way the body worked as well. Had some experience with sports and stuff as a kid growing up. Was not great at them. But uh, when I discovered exercise and I discovered you know, working out with weights specifically, I liked the self-determination aspect of it. I liked the progressive nature of it. Um, so that appealed to me a lot more than kind of the typical team-based sports. And that's why I ended up working in this arena professionally. I was able to find fitness success without having to be really an athlete, or at least um, at that time was not athletic. And through practice, through determination, was able to develop that in myself and now have the opportunity to share that with clients, which is awesome. It's my bread and butter. I'm in the gym training people many hours each and every day still. And then as I expanded outward and looked for more ways to sort of express myself creatively and to challenge myself professionally and, and do things that I find interesting and fun and, and maybe spend my free time where I'd otherwise be watching TV in perhaps more purposeful and useful ways, that's when I got into blogging and podcasting, writing for Paleo Magazine, ultimately hosting the podcast for them, which we've released over 100 episodes at this point. So I feel like that's been a, a really cool experience. And I'm actually editing Paleo Fitness Magazine at this point. Um, Kane over at, uh, the, the full print publication is still in charge over there, but, um, you know, definitely keeping myself busy and, and really enjoy being able to dive into this, you know, piece of the fitness world where, uh, I think things are becoming a little more progressive and thoughtful and considered. And that's one of the reasons why I really like what you guys are doing. And, um, that's what I'm, that's what I'm here for, man. And just rap about movement and, and kind of geek out on some of that stuff. Well, that's cool. You know, I mean, um, you know, you've been very cool to uh, feature me and GMB on, uh, you know, your stuff that you're doing too. And and today, though, I kind of want to take a look, though, really at, at what you're doing. You know, you're a big believer in the paleo lifestyle. And so there might be some people, some of our listeners out there who don't really, you know, know too much about the paleo lifestyle. So maybe if you could give us a little bit of a primer on that. And uh, just, you know, let us know why you just really think yeah. it's, you know, the bee's knees out there. So. <laughs> Great question, man, because <clears throat> I forget that there are people out there who don't follow the paleo diet. I think that as a trainer, I'm oftentimes a, a voice of authority, frankly, and clients look to me and yeah. really kind of value what I have to say. And, and so that's kind of insular in a way, and that kind of puts you in a bubble in a way where you think that everybody thinks that. Right. What you have to say is important, uh, which is not the case. And uh, then in the paleo world, I'm writing for Paleo Magazine and, and podcasting for Paleo Radio. And so really just kind of being in that in that world, a lot of the time, it, it, it sometimes I have to reconfigure my mindset and say, oh, OK, let's let's start from the basic assumption, which is that somebody has no idea what paleo is. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's out there listening to listening to this, maybe they've never heard the word paleo used before. The paleo diet was originally a way to, I guess, frame 
dietary recommendations. And so there are some early writers, S. Boyd Eaton, Lauren mm-hmm. Cordain, um, you know, researchers, you know, scientists with with uh, different backgrounds. I think S. Boyd Eaton was a gastroenterologist and Lauren Cordain was an exercise physiologist. And for one reason or another, they started to think, well, why do we spend all this time investigating the architecture of ancient peoples and the skeletons of our ancestors and try to understand how did they live and, and did they hunt with spears or, or knives or what did they do? And we have all this information and we've, we've done some good science to paint a reasonably close picture, I think, of what our, our ancestors were doing. And then we also have information from contemporary hunter-gatherer groups that give us a little bit of a sneak peek or a, a real-life sort of example of what it might have been like when human beings were wild. And I think that that's a thing that we're interested in and curious about because right now we're quote-unquote civilized. And so we live in this society um, that's far from basically living outdoors and, and camping 24 hours a day and having to fight and 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 seek out and, and kill your own food and, and uh, gathering things and maybe getting poisoned along the way and you know really an extreme lifestyle if you think about it. Yeah. So I think that's interesting to us and there's been some good science to give us a really uh, pretty clear picture of what that looked like. But the gap was taking that information and then saying recreate that or reimagine that or, or apply that in some way in your modern life. And so you have researchers who studied the lives of ancient people but there was never any talk about taking that information and, and turning it uh, around and saying, well, this is actually going to be a roadmap for how we could live. And the reason why that's such an important thing and, and such a significant change in the thought process is that we're facing some major issues. And while your audience is probably super engaged in terms of movement and not the average sedentary American, which I guess is you know kind of or sedentary Japanese person or whoever, um, we've got some serious issues with rising healthcare costs related to chronic diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, people are suffering from chronic disease states now at epidemic levels. Top killers of people, hands down, biggest cost to society, hands down, uh, biggest uh, thief of quality of life for many people. Um, fed by multinational companies, food companies, entertainment companies, driving us towards moving less, eating more, consuming more, uh, becoming less engaged, (laughs) questioning less, and just kind of going down that path. And so when this was first, when this ancestral health perspective was first offered up, it, I think it solves a lot of kind of problems because there's certainly advice and there's certainly been dietary advice and there's been lifestyle advice from many different sources and fitness professionals uh, among those sources, uh, medical professionals, et cetera. But I think what the paleo lifestyle did is it kind of ties a lot of these different pieces together. So rather than having a nutritionist say, well, eat, eat X, Y, and Z, and then having your, your personal trainer say, well, move your body and, and burn calories and do this. And then having your doctor tell you, well, cut salt and do this other thing. Well, why? Well, because, you know, there's a study and, you know, Maybe the study is true, but maybe it's not. And maybe there's there's other factors that weren't questioned. But there isn't really anything connecting them. It's sort of like you have to take it at face value, mm-hmm. uh, this advice. And then, of course, this conflicting advice. Because how many times have we heard that eggs are bad for us and then that they're yeah. good for us? Or yeah. that cholesterol is bad or that fat is good or fat's bad or carbs are bad? You know, So there's all these different voices yeah. that just lead to a lot of confusion, paralysis by analysis, and and the needle hasn't been moved. Our Our national health or our global health uh, problems have not been um, reversed in, in many ways. We're, we have more food and now we're dying, we're dying sooner than our, our, our parents who are going to die. Bad situation. Yeah. Um, paleo brings a lot of those things together in the sense that it provides a whole, uh, whole lifestyle uh, framework. I don't personally look at the paleo diet as a very strictly regimented diet. I look at it as a holistic lifestyle template. And by that, I mean food wise. And this is kind of really after all that stuff, getting back to your original question, food wise, it's eating things that I can recognize by sight. You know, if I can look at an apple, if I can look at a piece of broccoli or even read in an ingredients label and understand it and, and look at something and say, well, okay, it makes sense that there's five ingredients in this. 
versus something where there's 50 ingredients and you need a chemistry degree to decipher it. So I think really the first start is whole unprocessed foods as much as possible. Drinking water, you know, fruits and vegetables, um, quality meats, things of that nature. So whole natural food. And I don't even worry so much about the macronutrient breakdown. I don't even think that that's super essential at that first level. And especially from someone who's just coming at it from a you know basic health perspective mm -hmm. and coming off of perhaps a processed food conventional yeah. diet. Yeah. Um, so that diet is that first piece. And that's because we would have only been able to hunt and gather things for 99% of our time here on Earth. Most of our evolution, we didn't have refrigeration. Most of our evolution, mm -hmm. we didn't have food processing technologies. Most of our evolution, we didn't have other people making, preparing, selling, shipping uh, food to us. And then we just kind of eat it for, you know, a, a, a small effortless exchange of, um, you know, dollars or even bits and bytes on a okay. computer. So, you know, you take just that one piece, the food piece, and now it starts to click and we can start to say, okay, well, this is why it makes sense for us to eat this way. It's not just one expert's opinion. This is what human beings have been doing for thousands, if not millions of years. And then you can take that same thought process. Well, what did people do and how does that mesh with and how does that make sense for me today in my modern life? And does that give me some um, ideas for solving some of the issues that I'm facing, perhaps with my own personal health or on a larger scale, if you're trying to make a bigger impact in the world. And you can see that whether it's movement, mm -hmm. sleep, food, stress, there's some kind of tangible piece of the uh, health puzzle that can be solved with this perspective. Right now, people might be looking at this video and wondering why there's this like yellow aura. Um, I'm sure you can see it. That's because in my office, I'm using a, a light that is low in blue light. So it's a, it's a yellow light that is, it, it's 630 right now. If I look outside the window, it's dark outside. Hmm. So instead of having a light that's blasting my eyes with the frequency of light, our brains associate with mm -hmm. high noon, with daytime, and promoting cortisol level, uh, ex or cortisol excretion and, mm -hmm. and dampening melatonin production. You know, I have the light in my office and then the monitor on my computer shifted towards what would be dusk, sundown. And so even something like how do you set up the lights in your office if you look back to how did people live before? Well, they yeah. had a campfire. And when the sun went down, they might have stayed up for a little while. But for the most part, the lights are pretty low. And, yeah. you know, so something as simple as that can be um, – a launching off point for a health intervention and you don't even really need an expert to tell you that but right. it can be helpful to have the expert sort of explain the why absolutely you know something that i that i use on my computer and uh all of us in gmb when we're using it is uh, uh we all use max and so what we use is called flux and basically yep. i'm sure you know this and it's really great so for those of you who don't know about flux out there i'm not a representative of flux or anything like that i just think it's a great uh app for your computer it go ahead it Adjust the lighting on your computer based on what time it is outside, and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, That's what I have running on my computer right now. Yeah, so. me too, man. You gotta love <laughs> and, it. And I'm not paid by them either. <laughs> so I want to go a little bit deeper into this. I want to come back and ask a little bit about like some of the results and things that you've gotten sure. uh, with your with your clients with with paleo but i just kind of want to go a little bit deeper talking about the diet itself because i think it can be confusing because especially recently you see there's a lot of variations of the diet you might have the very strict paleo you've got oh goodness gracious i don't even like normal paleo and you've also got maybe uh, primal right so yeah the thing is you know i've even heard people say that you know, it's okay to maybe have rice or potatoes with this. Yeah. You know, I was paleo. I was on the strict side of paleo for two years. Did that um, pretty intensely. You know, I was working out, doing all that, and ended up, you know, adding potatoes and rice to my training. That was I found just worked better for me. But I'm a little confused though with how do we pick what's good for us in these in these paleo diets? And like I just said before, I'm. I'm thinking those are the main three. Am I correct in saying that? The strict, the normal, and then primal. What What's going on with that? How do we decide where we sure. should be or, or what we should be uh, choosing for our paleo diet? Great question. So the original paleo diet, so based on the paleo diet book by Lauren Cordain, uh -huh. was um, basically a diet free of, and I think sometimes it's helpful to know what's not paleo before we no. say what is paleo even 
if we're just looking at this particular iteration of the paleo diet. So that original paleo diet from Lauren Cordain was free of grains. So rice and corn and wheat and things of that nature, legumes like peanuts Mm -hmm. and soybeans. Um, It was free of industrial seed oils like canola oil, uh, cottonseed oil, um, hydrogenated oils. It was free of refined sugar. So that would be um, high high fructose corn syrup as well as added cane sugars and and even too much dried fruit and things of that nature. Um, And then it was also dairy free. So no cheese, uh, no milk, no yogurt. And what you're left with was lean meats, fruits and vegetables, um, sweet potatoes, things of that nature, uh, fish, eggs. Um, there's some allotment for nuts and seeds and water and, and don't use salt. Um, although herbs and spices and things like that would be considered okay. Um, and if you are going to use oil, maybe use olive oil or coconut oil, um, and try to make your meat grass fed meat if you can. And, um, that was kind of the original prescription. And so that was what most people start with. And, and that's kind of what was advocated by some of the paleo challenges that have kind of floated around like the whole 30. So people say, I'm doing a whole 30. Well, what's that? Well, it's kind of a strict version of paleo. Mm -hmm. Although it's worth noting that since that original iteration of, of the whole 30, even they've added, um, an allowance for white potatoes and they've added, and they've added ghee, which is you know more yeah. or less clar- clarified yeah. butter. So you can see how, as time goes on, that original version of paleo presented by Lauren Cordain, people started to say, okay, well, why why not potatoes and why not dairy? Well, the dairy piece is some people are sensitive to casein, mm-hmm. and there's a particular type of casein and kind of the industrial milk that most of us are drinking. So, well, if casein's the issue, a dairy product free of casein might not be an issue, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's ghee and sure. that's kind of the thought process there. So it's not just all dairy is bad and anything that's ever had contact with a cow is automatically bad. It's looking at it from a scientific, rational perspective. What are the problematic constituents mm-hmm. of that food? So we're starting with whole foods, but then we're kind of breaking it down even more. This whole food has a whole lot of different things going on in it. It has fat, it has carbohydrate, it has protein. Is there a specific aspect of that that's problematic? And with some minimal processing, I guess you could say, uh, it now becomes safe to eat. And we've been doing that to food for a long time. And there's a lot of foods that we cook um, and we don't eat raw for that reason, whether it's neutralizing toxins, making them more palatable or increasing the availability of nutrients. Um, So that strict original version of paleo started to get a little bit of a gray area around things like high fat dairy. And that's where Mark uh, Sisson with his Mm -hmm. primal diet primarily diverged. He opened up um, things like butter to the paleo diet. So adding butter in um, and Although Lauren Cordain did acknowledge in uh, Paleo for, I think it was Paleo for Athletes, which was a follow-up yeah, book yeah, to the Paleo yeah, diet, yeah. there was an allotment for more carbohydrate intake for endurance athletes and, and white potatoes. And I think his co-author, Joe Friel, even said, hey, if you want to drink a you know Coca-Cola on race day or something, go for it. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of that beginning of contextualization. And, and if somebody's... Um, a particular type of athlete, well, okay, now their Paleo diet has to change to fit that. And then again, continuing with carbohydrates as a kind of a deviation from that main version of the paleo diet, you had um, Paul Jaminé come in and put forth this notion of safe starch because with the original paleo diet, there were no white potatoes Mm -hmm. and it was kind of a lower carbohydrate uh, version of paleo. There wasn't really outside of squash and maybe fruits and things like that, a lot of carbs in it. And Paul Jaminé said, well, you know, most of the hunter gatherer groups in, in the world actually subsist off of a starchy staple. Um, if you look at New Zealand, it's, it's sago palm. If you mm-hmm. look at Asian countries, it's rice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it could be plantains in some parts of the world. Mm-hmm. It could be potatoes in some parts of the world, chestnuts, uh, whatever the case may be. Oftentimes, if you look at a group of human beings, a society, trace it back to its roots, there's some sort of super abundance of a starchy food that allowed that civilization to, th- uh, to thrive. Corn uh, with Aztecs. Mm-hmm. Um, so he started to kind of open up this conversation about safe starch. And for things like plantains, which are kind of like a starchy banana or uh, yucca, which is a starchy root similar to a potato or potatoes themselves, what was the ancestral carbohydrate intake? And in some human populations, that could be 20 percent, 30 percent. And so, you know, we start to look at um, even some of the bones of early peoples and you can see that the carbon in their bones, because you are what you eat, 
was from, um, uh, you know, basically like a, almost like a cattail that had a starchy root in it. So you could look at some evidence of ancient ancestors, not just contemporary hunter gatherers eating a higher carbohydrate content mm-hmm. diet. And then of course, on the other side of the uh, equator or on the other side of the, the pole, you have hunter gatherer groups that are eating almost no carbohydrate diets, like the Inuit eating mm-hmm. all fish, uh, blubber, seal meat, etc. And so when you start to look at all these things, you've got the sort of basic paleo template. You have some allotment for particular types of dairy with primal. You have an allotment for safe starch with the perfect health diet. Uh, and then you have people who are kind of mimicking the Inuit and doing mm. low carb or keto, uh, mm. short for ketogenic forms of yeah. the paleo diet. But here's the consistent thing. They're all based on uh, historical food patterns. Mm -hmm. They're all based on what people have done for a a long, long period of time and survived, if not thrived, because that's a great case example or a great um, block of evidence for the validity of it, at least for that population. Mm -hmm. And now we as modern humans, after, you know, everybody kind of shipped out of Africa and everybody shipped out of, you know, their, their ancestral homeland and spread out across the globe and human beings populated all different parts of the earth. And now in the modern era, we're we're moving around and flying around and, and doing all this other stuff. It's kind of hard for us to know what to eat because we've lost our food ways. We've lost our food traditions in, in, in many societies. And I, I'm speaking from my perspective as a, as a Westerner. Um, you know, we've got Thanksgiving, we've got Christmas, but, you know, we don't have, you know, grandma t- teaching us the recipes to cook the food that grows in the garden that, right. you know, her great, great grandfather right. started. Yeah. So, you know, there, there is some confusion there um, because there, there are, are different ways that you can take that template. But I think as long as you get to that core template and then you start experimenting and kind of like how you did, Hey, you started with basic paleo, you started with, you know, kind of the hardcore version. And then based on how you're feeling, you're willing to say, Hey, rice. People have been eating rice forever. Um, potatoes, same thing. People have been eating potatoes as soon as they could dig a potato up. Um, so why wouldn't you experiment with that? If you had had a different result where you felt worse after adding those foods in, maybe you could have gone down a different path and explored uh, even a lower carbohydrate form of paleo sure. or, or changing up other foods because there's certainly people that for autoimmune issues, for example, have sensitivities to nightshades or nuts or things that might even be okay in that hardcore paleo um, subset of foods. And now you have the autoimmune paleo protocol. So you can really see that this thing can go in any direction based on your individual needs, whether it's performance as an athlete, whether it's uh, disease treatment, but it's all coming back to that core of the, the human foods, the foods that grew from the earth, run around on the ground, swim in the sea, uh, fly in the air, the stuff that you can, you can actually identify, see, smell, touch. It's not a, a chemical manufactured at some plant in New Jersey that, you know, it's artificial, you know, banana flavor or whatever. And, you know, I think that that's, that's the core of it. And, yeah. and if people start there and kind of go back to that, um, I think that that will lead them down a path of healing and health. Um, and again, with the caveat that they're listening to themselves and, and responding to how they feel truthfully and honestly uh, when they eat certain foods. And, and I think you have a, a great example of that where you changed your diet and now are probably feeling better and, and yeah. maybe even look better. Yeah. Yeah. No, right on. Exactly what you said. And I think, you know, it's like anything is is in the beginning you do need to test something out and you need to figure out and follow that particular protocol for a certain amount of time and then once you uh, get that down and it's set then you can start either adding or subtracting or you know figuring out what works for you just like what you said and I think that's an important thing here to say because I do know that there's a lot of people who who will stick with a particular diet maybe you know it's not even paleo but a particular diet just because they think that that is exactly what they have to do, and even though it might not even fit them, they still try and fit that diet into their lifestyle and end up having a lot of problems with it. So, um, yeah, we start to wrap up morality and philosophy yes, and a lot of other yes, things with yes. our diet. And, and, and for anybody who eats the way that they do for religious reasons or for um, philosophical reasons, more power to you, yeah. do you. You know, yeah. I think everybody has the right to eat really whatever the heck they want to eat. And I'm not going to, you know, be the person to say that they're wrong because there's the nutritional perspective, yeah. there's the cultural perspective, there's a religious perspective, spiritual, etc. So maybe somebody's eating a vegan diet, it's not perhaps optimal for their biology, 
but they're they're choosing to do that for ethical reasons or, yeah. or whatever. Great. Good do on that. It. Yeah. Um, exactly. But I think if we're looking at it from the perspective of what is the absolute best thing for this meat skeleton that we're riding around uh, in, on the earth with, mm -hmm. you know, our physical body, what does this animal need? You know, think about yourself the way that you would think about a pet that you really care about and want to live a yeah. long time and be healthy and happy and thriving. Would you give your this this ideal pet, whether it's a dog or a cat or whatever, poor quality food and and not allow it to express its natural behavior and wake it up in the middle of the night with lights and loud noises and you know stress it out all the time and be mean to it? And that's kind of what we're talking about because we do that to ourselves a lot of the time. That's a good way of looking. So yeah. if we think, I want to. I want to love the crap out of this thing, you know, this body that I have, and and I want to treat it the best that I possibly can with all the tools at my disposal, movement, food, sleep, lifestyle, et cetera, uh, how I sit, how I, you know, all these different things, how I interact with other people, my relationships, yeah. huge stuff. Um, if you look at it from the perspective of, of trying to do the best that you possibly can for yourself, I think that that's, that's what I'm trying to get at with paleo. That's and so that's good. it might not be paleo orthodoxy, um, but I do think that it, um, it comes back to that. That's the baseline. That's the foundation. Nice. And then, you know, you layer the context on as you go along and, and, and just like with movement, develop mastery and yep. more kind of confidence in, in moving through the world without needing that rigid prescription. Nice, man. So I do know that there are a lot of athletes that are using paleo uh, to help them with their workouts. But the thing is, the majority of my listeners here uh, aren't athletes. In fact, you know, they have, you know, a real job, you know, busting their yeah. butts, doing, you know, living their lives, things like that. And and sometimes they just, it's tough to even squeeze in a workout either before or after work. So I'm really interested though, to hear about what kind of results you've gotten with your clients and, and really why should we, I mean, I know we talked before and you explained a really great explanation about how paleo could be good for us, but what are some of the results that we can see by, uh, by using a paleo type diet? I'll start with myself, you know, I'll start with the results that I got, because I think that that's where it really does all start for a lot of people. How did you help yourself? I think is the first sort of case history or first sort of case example most people have. And for me, I was a personal trainer. Um, I was, I was well-educated when it comes to diet and exercise. And what I was doing for many years was a very high carbohydrate diet. Um, it was whole grains. I, I knew enough to get off the processed food for the most part, but I still was eating lots and lots of oatmeal, mm. lots and lots of whole wheat, mm -hmm. uh, whole wheat crackers with peanut butter and, mm. um, you know, things of that nature. So it was a much higher carbohydrate intake. And I had bought into this idea that you should never be hungry. So you should be snacking basically all day that that somehow raises your metabolism. And so every two or three hours you should have some sort of snack. And so I'd have, you know, maybe a you know, a, a Greek yogurt with oats and blueberries and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some honey and protein powder mixed in and, you know, generally what people would consider super healthy stuff. And and I think most people out there in the world who are, you know, maybe eating McDonald's and I certainly was one of them at one point, but I'd, I'd moved past it once I kind of got into my career. Um, if you're still eating McDonald's Greek yogurt with honey and oats and all that stuff, that sounds like, how do you get any healthier than that? Yeah. yeah. But what I found myself experiencing was that by eating every two or three hours and always having carbohydrates really entering into my system, I was constantly on this up and down sort yeah. of hunger roller coaster mm -hmm. and I'd eat and then basically I'd start counting down the time between my next meal. So it's like eat a meal, think about your next meal, eat, eat a meal, think about your next meal. And a lot of my exercise was really geared around burning off quote unquote uh, my yeah. calories. And yeah. so run for two hours, uh, you know, well, running for two hours, that burns off 1,600 calories. Now I've got 1,600 calories to play with. And so that was a big part of the thought process. Um, you know, wake up in the morning, teach a boot camp, do the boot camp, you know, run myself, you know, basically into the ground, drink a diet uh, monster energy drink because sugar's bad, but artificial sweeteners, you know, you know, there's no calories there. I'm feeling like a, the walking dead, using exercise and quote unquote healthy foods to to kind of prop myself along, um, bags under my eyes, mm -hmm. falling asleep at the wheel, tired all the time, um, really not looking great, honestly, in, in terms of my physique, looking, I guess, fit or thin or or whatever and having uh -huh. some muscle definition, but not looking like an Adonis. Yeah. 
yeah. especially for the hours that I put in. I thought, well, if you just put enough time in the gym, you're going to have a great physique. Well, yeah. that actually doesn't work uh, or it didn't work for me. I wasn't one of those genetically blessed people that didn't have to do anything to look good. And, and somehow me working out harder didn't make me look better, which was really frustrating. So I lived like that for quite some time. And, and kind of like how you were saying before with people that follow a diet despite what their body is telling them or, or follow a lifestyle despite the fact that it's not working for them, I held on and I held on for dear life because I thought that if I let go, uh, it would all hell would break loose and that I would lose complete control and I'd go on an everlasting binge that would lead me to obesity because I thought that our brain is programmed to eat and eat and eat and eat and that we're just never going to be satisfied and that our body is dumb, frankly, and doesn't know what it needs and that we need to control it and we have to be a harsh taskmaster of our body. And you can kind of see here a uh, juxtaposition between my current perspective, which is more of a loving kindness approach yeah, yeah. to our physical self yeah. versus the uh, maybe benign dictator at best and a harsh dictator at worst. And so punishing myself with exercise, eating foods that didn't really make me feel good, although they're accepted by the conventional wisdom as healthy, maybe high carbohydrate, low fat, whole grain, et cetera. And feeling like crap. When I first began the paleo diet, it was prompted by an interaction with a client who asked me, have you ever heard of the paleo diet? And I said, no. Um, but if you are thinking about doing it, I'll, I'll give it a go with you. Mm. And it was just sort of a spontaneous um, sort of idea to, hey, I'll try this thing out. I've never heard about it. I'll give it a go. And ended up picking up a copy of Lauren Cordain's paleo diet. Me and this client went on a 30-day paleo diet challenge. That first week, after the first couple of days, which I think were a little bit, little bit rough, I was almost on this like natural high for a week oh, yeah. where I felt crazy energy that I hadn't experienced in, in recent memory. Mm -hmm. And um, that was pretty notable and, and pretty impactful. So when the 30 days ran out, and I think I was too strict with that first Ooh. version of paleo because I was still kind of binging and still maybe not oh, okay. supplying myself with enough calories, maybe losing a little bit too much weight, getting a little mm. too defined. Um, you know, for, for what my body kind of needs to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, but I kept with it and 30 days turned into 60 days, turned into 90 days. I gave primal a shot. So I started adding back the high fat dairy. I started to, um, experiment with lowering my carbohydrate intake. Cause when I first started doing mm -hmm. paleo, I'm like fruits on the paleo diet. So I'm going to do a fruit smoothie. That's basically, you know, a gallon of blended up berries and apples and beets and carrots and things like yeah. that. So, um, you know, I, I went through that phase and then kind of went into this more low carb mode and mm. kind of found that it helped me to put some muscle on and my sex drive improved, which mm -hmm. frankly it had been flagging and, you know, I'm a married man. You know, that's not, <laughs> that's not something that you want to have happen to yourself when you're in your late twenties. Yeah. Um, so I think that first iteration of paleo that I went through, it was too low fat for me, sure. perhaps a little sure. bit too high carb for me. And, um, you know, as I started to go a little bit more low carb, I started to let go of some of the chronic cardio that I had been doing. I, I realized that I didn't have to work out. I, I didn't have to pound the payment. I didn't have mm. to swim laps in the pool. I didn't have to do the elliptical machine and the bike and all that stuff mm. every day to maintain my weight. So I think for me, that was kind of an indicator that, you know, for my physiology, a little bit of a lower carbohydrate diet works. That naturally led to experimentations with fasting. That naturally led to experimentations with, you know, some other kind of more extreme versions of paleo. But that was all that that end of one, that study of one, that exploration of, well, what is my paleo diet? Because you start with somebody else's paleo diet. And I like that. If I could just interrupt there. And I think that's yeah. a big thing, you know, exploration. And, and like we were talking about earlier is, I mean, you do need to start somewhere. And so, you know, if you don't have that reference point, then it's going to be difficult to be able to figure out what is good for you. But but like I said, you know, like we we're talking about earlier, I think it's uh, maybe unfortunate sometimes that people get stuck in thinking that it has to be a certain way. And I like what you just said about, you know, exploration and figuring out what works for you. And, but, you know, giving it that first 30 right. days and taking the time to make sure to see if it's going to work or not. Because exactly. let's be honest, there are people out there who might try it a week or might try it two weeks. And, you know, after one week, they're still at that phase where, it's nothing's going to feel good, you know, after that first mm -hmm. week, but, you know, at least give it to hopefully a month or even a little bit longer before you start tweaking it or, you know, trying to explore, like you said. But I think that's a very good point that you bring up is, you know, you've got to find out what works for you. And, and so that's why I think that, you know, not just doing something, but being aware of what you're doing all the time and, 
you know, writing the stuff down and making sure, you know, totally. not just what you're eating, but what kind of exercise that you're doing, how you're feeling that day and things like that. So pardon me for interrupting, but I yeah, know absolutely really good, you know, I think, uh, point there. I think that's, that's right on. And, and kind of what you're describing is it's like you pull out a map first step, find out where you are. Yeah. And I think that that basic version of paleo is a good way to kind of give yourself uh, a starting point. And I like it as a starting point because I think that, you know, there's, there's so many options for everybody within the paleo template. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you, you know, you want the higher carbohydrate intake. There's a path to that. You need a little bit lower carb. There's a path to that. Um, do you want to still enjoy baked goods and, and, you know, things of that nature from time to time? There's, there's accommodations for that as well. So I think that basic version of paleo, that's, that's ultimately what I do recommend most people follow. Just as you said, for, you know, 30 days, at least that's a good testing time. My personal after, I think I started this in 2010, I was thinking about the, the date, uh, just today. And mm -hmm. I believe it was 2010 when I first uh, made the transition to, to, eating a paleo diet and, and, and my kind of first, uh, explorations in that arena. Um, it's going to be 2016 soon. This yeah. podcast might even come out in 2016 and yeah. depending on the release date. So six years deep and I'm still modifying, I'm still changing. So that's part of why I don't just tell people to do what I do. And that's you know, good. Just, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is my path and this is my journey and I'm six years deep into paleo, but that was, I was already 10 years deep into trying to turn my life around sure. and, and, and get healthy at that point. So sure. it's a lifetime. It's a journey. Kind of yeah, get man. comfortable with that. So um, looking at some general principles then, I think, because yeah. this is kind of leading to, you know, a good thing and, you know, asked about results and things. But if we kind of step back, really, if let's say that we want to go ahead and just look at this as a broad overview then and look at some of the just the general principles of where do we start i guess is is right. the best way uh, to ask here then so where do we start yeah so basic iteration of the paleo diet fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. good quality meats some nuts and seeds uh plenty of fresh water quit drinking <laughs> yeah yeah that's always yeah. that's a tough one because you know people will do everything else but and then, then they keep drinking, like, you know, but can I still have my glass of yeah. scotch or my glass yeah. of wine? Yeah. Yeah. That's like a deal yeah. breaker. Yeah. Um, yeah. get off the sugar. Yeah. Just do that. Heck, do it for a week. If you can, if you can suck it up and do that for a week, I guarantee you're going to feel different. And at least now you're going to know that there's another possibility. Sure. And yeah. it's like, you know, one of the most overused analogies at this point, but, uh, it's like that scene from the matrix where he's offered the red pill or yeah. the blue pill. Yeah. Well, if you go down the rabbit hole once and if you go down the paleo rabbit hole for a week or 30 days, it's kind of hard to come back and go back to eating that fake, right. uh, that fake steak or whatever it was yeah. the guy, uh, was eating in that movie. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that that's a good starting point, basic version of the paleo diet. Um, start there in terms of physical movement, get out and go for a walk, do nice. something, nice. stretch, just move your body in some way get out of this mindset that you have to constantly be burning calories and that exercise is a way to manage a bad diet. Mm. Treat exercise as a way to nourish your body with movement because movement has chemical, uh, mechanical, um, emotional effects on your body just as food does. It's just another input. So food's one, movement's another one. Mm -hmm. Third thing would be sleep. Nice. Try to actually get to bed at a reasonable time. Um, a lot of our wake times are inflexible, especially if you have a regular job. Me, I work a 50, 60 hour a week, quote unquote, regular job, and I'm up at 520 for mm. sure, uh, five days a week. And that doesn't that doesn't change. Like if I cancel clients, I'm making less money and I'm kind of shirking my responsibilities and I'm not going to do that. So what I can do is go to bed earlier. Yeah. And that took a long time to cozy up to because I really held on to this idea that I could stay up till 11 and then get up at five or yeah. four or whatever the case yeah. may be. And that somehow I was the one person in the world who actually did need five or six hours of sleep per night and that I didn't need seven or eight. And what I was doing was I was lying to myself um, because that is a hundred percent not the case. And so if you have to go to go to bed earlier, so you have food, you have movement, you have sleep. I would say the next thing is probably going to be stress mm -hmm. because a lot of us don't have the best coping mechanisms for managing our day-to-day -day stress. And I fell into that boat for a long time, short tempered, uh, easily frustrated, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it, it, it's damaging, I think, to our relationships. It's damaging to our bodies. Stress eats away at your body like, uh, like a disease and precipitates yeah. many diseases. If you stress out a laboratory animal and, and keep it awake and make loud noises and treat it poorly, it will literally die. So stress will straight up kill you. And so it can't be discounted. You could have every other piece of the puzzle in place. And if you're killing yourself with stress, it's not going to matter. I remember one time working a job that I really wasn't happy in and um, driving on, on uh, you know, a major highway, you know, pulling into the, the exit where uh, my job was, the closer I get, the more nauseous I got. Oh, and, wow. and, I, and I almost, I almost... I think I actually could have vomited had I had I kind of you know gone that that little step further. So being literally sick to my stomach with stress because of this wow. this job. Yeah. So that was something that when the opportunity presented itself, and this was during my paleo journey, I said, "Let's go. Let's ship out and mm. and and take a chance to do something different." I don't know what that is, but I'm gonna take a stab at it because this isn't working. So that's another piece of it, stress. And then the fifth part of that kind of spoke or that fifth part of the wheel mm-hmm. would be social connection. Uh, and are you treating your friends, family, loved ones, um, you know, with the attention and time that they deserve? Um, and then you could say your intrapersonal relationships, which is your relationship with yourself. Are you treating yourself the way that you deserve? And this kind of goes to what I was saying before. Uh, if you were a prized um, pet or if you were a, a loved one, how would you treat that loved one? Well, treat yourself like that and then you'll probably be in good shape. So that would be my my paleo starter kit. I and like actually, that. Yeah, five the five yeah five principles there. So I really like that. I think it's good. Cool. And you know, for everyone out there, really, if you think about it, just you know, focusing on what you're eating, you know, what you're doing with your body, making sure you're sleeping, getting that recovery, and then of course focusing on keeping that stress down, the bad stress, right. you know, and then. How do you interact with people in the world? That's wonderful. Yeah. I like that, and, and, and that's the thing, man. This doesn't have to be a polarizing conversation. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's plenty of people who will, who will gain page views and who will gain popularity by coming out and saying, you know what? Everybody out there in the world's a stupid idiot and they're eating the wrong things. And if you do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to have superhuman yeah. health, uh, infinite lives, yeah. and you know, some other game genie <laughs> codes. Um, <laughs> jump higher, you know, run faster, yeah, all that right. stuff, yeah. you know, but coming out hard with a real specific prescription. Hey, if I came out with a real specific prescription and put a thousand people through it, you're going to have plenty of before and afters that you can use sure. because you know, the other 90% you're going to ignore. Yeah. So any diet or exercise program technically works for some people. Mm-hmm. So that's not really the goal. It's what are the things that we can all do and all benefit nice. from? I like and I think that. if we look at that stuff, it's really hard to argue against any of those points as being worthy of uh, practice and time and, and, and uh, attention. Cool, man. So Paleo Magazine, you, get, you really do a great job on that. Um, you know, we were talking earlier and I was, you know, mentioned my boy Nate Miyake. Yeah. He's on the cover. I was pretty surprised oh, about yeah. that, to be honest, but that's really cool. Um, just tell us a little bit about, uh, about the magazine. And right. uh, what's going on with that? So kind of to break down the whole the Paleo Magazine family, I think that that would that would be kind of a good way to to kind of introduce that to your or your listeners if they haven't already come across it. So we have a print publication, Paleo Magazine, that goes out and it's on newsstands and in bookstores and uh, it's mailed to people um, all across the world. So there's worldwide distribution of, of the print publication, Paleo Magazine. And it was the first magazine dedicated to the Paleo lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And it might actually be it might still be the only one that's actually in print. So there's a lot of digital wow. options out there at this point, but this might, I think it might actually be the only print one still. Nice. Um, I don't know if anybody's even gotten into that, that space. Of course there's gluten free magazines and CrossFit mm-hmm. magazines mm-hmm. and things like that, but something specifically dedicated to paleo. Uh, I, I think we're still kind of the only person uh, or only company that's doing that. And our perspective is kind of more progressive paleo and we're, we're willing to look at the whole lifestyle and it's not this real strict dogmatic approach. And so if somebody's maybe a little turned off from the idea of paleo and they see paleo and they see it as a label, I encourage you to pick up a copy of Paleo Magazine and just thumb through it. Because just like the stuff that I was talking to you today, most of the information in there is stuff that everybody can really get in on on some level. 
Um, so it's not about creating an orthodoxy and it's not about creating a religion. It's not about creating paleo fanatics. It's about getting people healthy and making a difference in this world by putting forth useful information that people can then take and, and apply. And so that's what we're all about. And that was the start of all this paleo magazine stuff. As Paleo Magazine went on and started to grow, they branched out into digital uh, publications. Paleo Magazine Insider is one. And if you go on paleomagonline.com, which is just our website, and sign up for our newsletter, that's actually what you get. You get Paleo uh, Magazine Insider. It's unique content separate from the print publication. Yeah, yeah. So it's totally different stuff, recipes, mm-hmm. uh, fitness tips, et cetera, but just in a digital format. So if somebody doesn't want to you know, sit down and read something and maybe they just want to look on their e-reader or phone or whatever, that's an option there. And then recently, uh, well, I guess 100 episodes ago, we started the Paleo Magazine radio podcast. And that, you know, episode two was Lauren Cordain. And we've had yourself on the show. And we've had Mark Sisson. And we've had um, people completely outside of the Paleo world, um, you know, Kyle Maynard. And, um, you know, there's just been a, a huge variety of guests on this show that if somebody checks it out. We're on iTunes and, and, you know, we keep it all free. It's completely available. Nothing's behind a paywall or anything like that. You can go to our website or go to iTunes, Paleo Magazine Radio. Again, it's all about finding interesting people, people that have a perspective that's useful. It could be an entrepreneur. It could be a doctor. It could be a scientist. It could be a paleo blogger or whoever. But I think everybody has a, a human story that other people can connect to and find value in. So that's, that's our podcast. Um, and then the newest thing, kind of the newest offering is paleo fitness and just like the paleo magazine insider it's also a digital publication it's not uh it's not free we're, we're charging for it and that's kind of a risk it's a little bit of an ask there's a lot of content that's available for free online and, and you yourself are in that world where you know there's content that's free and then there's content that's paid so we're putting out content this time um that is online it exists in the digital space but we're we're investing just as much in promote in uh, production values and just as much uh, time and attention crafting this that we do the regular print version of Paleo Magazine. And so all the all the quality that people would expect from Paleo Magazine is there in Paleo cool. Fitness. Contributors, top notch. I mean, again, you got Ryan Hurst in this thing. <laughs> You've got Nate Miyake in this thing. <laughs> um, but you know, there's there's so there's so many diverse voices, but it's all coming back to not just paleo now, but mm-hmm. paleo fitness because you know what? We have the conventional uh, food world. We have the processed food and all that stuff, but we've got the conventional fitness world. And that's what we're trying to be an antidote to. And so we're showing real people. The covers aren't photoshopped. Um, you know, it's, it's legit information that's not meant to deceive, confuse, and manipulate you. It's meant to empower you. Nice. And it happens to be in the fitness space. So it could be food for performance. It could be body fat uh, reduction techniques, but we're shooting straight and trying to make you think a little bit differently and, and, and more deeply. And so, again, paleo doesn't mean that this is a CrossFit magazine. Paleo yeah. doesn't mean that this is a, a run around in the woods, uh, you know, completely naked. Uh, that's not our, our fitness prescription, you know, donning loincloths and, and clubbing uh, small animals. Um, this, is, this is a modern day lifestyle. This is a legitimate way to, to kind of uh, create an operating system for success in, in being a human being and, and in the fitness space or with Paleo Magazine and some of the other stuff in the, in the broader lifestyle space. And so that's kind of the things that we're doing. And, you know, I think a lot of it is ambitious. And, you know, lately I've been thinking a lot about it and, and, and feeling very passionate that this is uh, information that needs to be heard and cool. seen and received and shared in the world because, you know, it might not change the trajectory of the, of the human species as a whole, but you might be able to influence a uh, single person or a couple people or a dozen people and you do that and then you have changed the world. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a worthy, uh, a worthy goal and worthy venture and that's really what we're trying to do. I love that. I love that. Also about which is about empowerment and you know, letting people know that they do have control over what they're doing instead of just being like a robot <laughs> right. thinking there has to be some way. Good stuff, man. And speaking of empowerment, I want you to <laughs> to empower us. Let us know how how can we grill the perfect. Steak. Oh, okay. I've been waiting to ask you this all the time. <laughs> Steaks, my favorite food out there. I love to barbecue over here in Japan. Yes. What's the secret to the to creating or grilling the perfect steak? 
Got it. So, so first and first, first and first, mostly. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you ever watch uh, the Kroll Show and no, Bob no. Service. Oh, all right, never mind. Um, so, a good piece of meat. So the steak itself, the the food itself, that's the starting point. So for me, I really am going to go for a grass fed ribeye. That's my choice of steak, and the reason for that is not only is the meat very tender, but it it's a, a cut of meat that's generally well marbled with fat. Fat makes things taste good. I'm not shy to go for the fatty steak, especially when that fat is from a cow that ate grass and is full of nutrients and tastes amazing. So first step, a nice, you know, maybe an inch thick ribeye steak from a grass fed and grass finished cow. Mm. I want the real deal. Mm. I want to taste, uh, I want to know what, that I'm eating a cow basically. I don't want it to taste like inert, you know, protein matter. So uh-huh. something that's got flavor, that's got substance. Um, seasoning wise, I'm generally going to go with a good quality extra virgin olive oil, salt and pepper, and maybe like thyme or a little rosemary, um, if I'm feeling a little, a little adventurous, but in more than more often than not, it's good quality olive oil, salt, um, a nice, uh, naturally mined salt. That's got some texture and some, some, some body to it. And then some good fresh ground black pepper. And nice. so you get Keep that simple. I like that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you get your steak coated with that. Um, then you got to pay attention to the grill itself. You, charcoal. That's, yes. that's yes. the choice. You know, yes. that's the option. You know, I'm I'm not going to do the Hank Hill roti- routine and, and promote <laughs> propane and propane accessories. It is a way to grill. And if that's what you have and that's what you're u- using, fine. But if you want the full experience, human beings have been cooking over fire since before we were human beings. And there's actually some good evidence that shows that cooking with fire actually led us to being human beings. So go back to your roots, get <laughs> get primal on this thing, get some good lump charcoal um, use a charcoal starter. It's just like a metal kind of, it looks almost like a little like tiny chimney with a yeah, handle on it. Yeah. Yep. Load it up, start it with some newspaper or some paper. So there's no petrochemicals. There's no lighter fluid or anything like that involved. It will start all of your coals and get them red hot very quickly. Dump that into your grill. I, um, recently, uh, treated myself and bought a big green egg, which is a Kamado style grill, which oh. originally was inspired by, I think it might've been rice cookers, um, that, uh, world war II um, GIs saw in Japan and brought the idea back to the United States. And then that was the genesis of the Kamado grills. One of which is the big green egg. Nice. So, uh, there's, there's a little Japanese connection there. Okay. Um, so I'm using a big green egg. Any grill would do, um, hot coals, you want to sear a steak. You don't want to overcook it. You don't want it to be well done. You want there to be a little little blood. You want there to be a little uh, little rawness at the center. Um, but a really hot, ripping hot grill, throw that steak on there. We're talking like three minutes aside. Mm. Get some char. Um, you know, sizzle the fat a little bit. You want it to be, you know, medium rare, I would say, is as far as you want to take the steak. Three minutes on each side, pull that thing off, let it rest as long as you let it cook, and and dive in. And Not that would be my recipe for the perfect steak. Yeah, I'm, I'm already hungry. It's, <laughs> it's, ah, yeah. No, nice. that's wonderful, man. Thank you so much. Uh, that's the question I've been waiting for the entire interview. All those stuff <laughs> was just you know, a little chit-chat. <laughs> Get to the important stuff. Uh, hey, listen, you know, where can we find more info about you and what's going on with you? Right. So I try to make it easy for all my own personal accounts like social media and things like that. You can just go to Tony Fed Fitness. And so Facebook.com slash Tony Fed Fitness, Instagram at Tony Fed Fitness, Twitter at Tony Fed Fitness. Cool. Pretty straightforward. Um, we'll go ahead and put the links in there for everybody. Perfect. So that make it even easier. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's an easy way to do it. I've got oh, one yeah. final question for you. And that is any parting words of wisdom for listeners out there? Yeah, you know, you know, coming on here and, and coming to your house, I guess uh, you could say I wanted to maybe, you know, uh, think about okay, these are these are people that are 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 doing gymnastics movements and 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 getting kind of creative with their their physical expression. And one of the things that I've been doing recently that if someone is out there listening to this and they're not doing this already, here's a little little tidbit that I would like to to pass on. 
mindfulness and movement um, that's cultivate, you know, mindfulness cultivated in meditation can uh, be applied to movement. And so if you're uh, investing some time each day, uh, cultivating stillness in your mind, being aware of your breathing, being aware of your body, perhaps uh, participating in, in some sort of mindfulness practice, uh, transcendental meditation, qigong, uh, yoga, something of that nature, start developing that present mindedness, that, that, that deep, deep, deep connection to your body where you dissolve. So you are your body, get to that point and then start bringing that into all the different movements that you're doing, whether it's, uh, working on the rings or doing pushups or, pushing the grocery cart around the grocery store. Because once you start that, you can practice anywhere. Even standing up or sitting down doing a podcast can become part of your practice. And so that um, would be my my little parting uh, bit of advice. Absolutely wonderful. I love hearing that. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, looking forward to talking to you again. Yeah, man. And um, as always, I, I learn so much whenever I talk to you. So... Great talking to you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Again, we'll have the links up there where you can find more info about Tony. Until then, keep moving. Thanks for listening. For more great info, join us over at gmb.io. And be sure to check us out on iTunes and YouTube.